Good morning, Shalom. Uh, praise the Lord and welcome to class. Uh, we'll begin class. Uh, so last week we looked at um, uh, the latter half of uh, First Timothy chapter one, and we also studied uh, chapter two. In First Timothy chapter one, we saw you know Paul giving Timothy reasons why he should remain in Ephesus and minister there and he also emphasizes of uh, living in love with a uh, with a pure heart clear conscience and genuine uh, faith and in chapter 2 he begins to deal with the matters related to a local church where paul encourages timothy and the believers you know to pray for all people uh, including kings and those in uh, positions of power and he says that when we pray for others, what will be the result? He says it results in quiet and peaceful lives and that we will live in all godliness and reverence towards God. Okay, So Paul is emphasizing this practice and he says this is not only good, but also this is very pleasing uh, to our God and our Savior. And additionally, we see that Paul provides instructions for women and uh, gives them guidance on how to pray. And he talks about, and he addresses the role of a woman. Um, and uh, he, when he's addressing the role of the women in the, uh, in the local church, you know, he's basically addressing it in the context of the cultural uh, settings there in which they were um, living, Be uh, basically because, um, you know, of the goddess Diana and the priestess who were very, Okay, sorry, uh, the students are not able to join because uh, no. Just a minute, please. I'll just post the link again to. the students because they're not able to join class. Okay, that is why we're wondering why uh, students haven't joined classes yet. Okay, I hope they're able to join now. Okay, we'll continue with our recap until then the, you know, the other online students can join in. So the, the priests who were, uh, you know, in uh, serving at the temple of Dinah, they were very vocal about the superior, superiority of women over men. Okay, so Paul did not want this cultural, uh, you know, uh, way of living that was their culture, that the way women were living. He did not want that to become part of the church. And he also did not want heretical teaching and women establishing superiority over men in the uh, church. So we see, you know, Paul goes on to mention uh, in chapter 2, you know, about God's governmental order in the church and um, where he talks about where man is the head and women are to walk in submission to men, but he does not, uh, you know, uh, and this does not mean that, you know, women cannot uh, uh, preach or teach that, you know, this does not mean that men, are, women are deprived of operating in the gifts. They can operate in all the gifts. They can uh, flow in their calling and operate in their calling and the anointing that God has placed on their um, lives. Okay, so that was uh, briefly a recap of what we looked at in uh, chapter one and chapter two of uh, of uh, First Timothy. Um, now we'll uh, study uh, First Timothy chapter three. So can a few of you uh, read? 
uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, please. A few verses each. We'll begin our study of 1 Timothy chapter 3 this morning. This is a beautiful saying. If a man desires a position of a bishop, he desires a good thing. A bishop then must be blameless, a husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. Amen. Thank you. Uh, can someone continue reading from verses 4 to uh, verse 8, please? No one rules his own house, nor heaven his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a an, not an novice, this being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, this he fall into reproach and the sneer of the devil. Likewise, because must be reverent, not double tongue, not given too much wine, not greedy for money. Thank you. Amen. Uh, can somebody continue reading verses 9 to the end of the chapter, please, to verse 16? Anyone would like to read verses 9 to the end of the chapter? But they shall proceed to order, no order. For their fooling shall manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manners of life, hope of speech, locks of partiality, patience, persecution, affliction, which came unto me at Antioch. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt, Abu Bakr. Are you reading First Timothy chapter three, verses uh, nine to verse sixteen? First Timothy chapter oh, three. First Timothy chapter three. Okay. Verse nine. Holding the mysteries of faith in a pure conscience, and let this also first be proved. Then let them use the office of deacon, being found blameless. Even so much that his wife be grieved, not slanderous, sober, faithful, all things. Let the deacon be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own elsewhere. For the for they that have used this office of the deacon yeah. will possess to them to themselves a good degree and great goodness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write on I unto thee, open to to come unto thee shortly. Unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, thou that thou mayest know how thou ought <coughs> to behave thyself in the house of God, which is, is the church of the living God the pillars and the grounds of the truth, and without controversy great. These mysteries of good godliness, God was manifest in his flesh, justified in the spirit, sins of angels, which unto the Gentiles, believe on him on in the world, receive up unto glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So that was First Timothy chapter three, and uh, we see that in First Timothy chapter two, you know, uh, but uh, Linden uh, is, you know, I posted on the stream page again, so he can join if he clicks on the stream page. Oh, okay, Buster. The uh, link I in, in the stream page, is it, Pastor? Yes, yes. Okay, Pastor. Okay, yeah. Sorry, Pastor. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Thank you, uh, John Paul. Okay, 
So, um, so Paul has just written that women should not hold any position of spiritual or doctrinal authority over the congregations at the churches at Ephesus. But, you know, he does not want to leave this impression that, you know, because men are in authority in God's governmental structure in the church, which God has placed, that uh, men are in places of authority, of spiritual authority and leadership, that any man is qualified, uh, uh, you know, to come to a, uh, to a position of spiritual authority or to be a, a spiritual leader. So no man is qualified to be a spiritual leader in the church just because of his gender, just because he's a male. But, uh, you know, Paul goes on to list or lists or, you know, he goes on to mention the qualifications required for church um, leadership. Okay. Now, He's talking here in this passage, he's beginning at talking in this passage about, uh, you know, the qualifications required for a bishop and for a, then for a deacon. Now, in the early church, uh, you know, the early church basically recognized those who served in a local church in two broad categories. One is bishops and the other is uh, deacons, okay? Now, um, of course, the church comprised of saints. Saints means all believers. And they also had people in uh, responsibility who were uh, the bishops and the uh, deacons. Now, in the early church, bishop refers to those who were spiritual leaders or spiritual overseers of the church. Okay. So if we talk about uh, bishops in uh, in the present day context, you know, it would basically mean uh, those in, if you look at it in, at all people's church, it would be people who are, bishops could be referred to as people who are worship pastors, children's church pastors, uh, children's church ministers, you know, people basically in spiritual leadership. Okay. Uh, and we'll come to that in, in detail. And we see that deacons is talking about people who are in the administration department, organization, uh, 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 you know, uh, organizing things, people who are helping and supporting in the uh, church. Okay. So uh, the word bishop here in verse one, he says, you know, this is a faithful saying if a man desires a position of a bishop. So the word bishop is from the Greek word episcope which means a spiritual leader, someone who's involved in spiritual ministry, someone who's giving spiritual inputs, uh, in, uh, uh, giving spiritual inputs in the lives of God's people. Okay. If we uh, read Acts chapter 20, verse 28, the early church where it refers to bishops as spiritual overseers, who are to shepherd the people and take care of them. So there were basically spiritual leaders who were spiritual overseers and spiritual ministry, you know, taking care of God's uh, people. So in the present day context, in our church, bishops would mean, you know, uh, worship pastor, children's church pastor, children's church ministers, uh, like that. But, you know, I, I know in the mainline church, bishop means somebody who is the overall head, overall um, authority. And deacons comes from uh, the Greek word means uh, attendant, somebody who is waiting upon you, a waiter, anyone serving in any capacity in the local church. So, you know, somebody who's helping out with uh, the book table, the serving tea, you know, um, uh, you know, doing ushering and all of those are called deacons. So people who are basically responsible for any administrative, organizational uh, support and help or function in the uh, church. Now, when we look at uh, the book of Acts, you know, uh, chapter 6, uh, we we find out that there were, you know, we read that there were seven men who were, you know, full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. Uh, but we see that their role was to serve food every day. Okay. So they're basically deacons. And deacons grew out of this uh, context. You know, there were seven men who were full of the Holy Spirit, 
full of wisdom and the role was to serve food every day to all the poor and the widows so the word deacon grew out of that context since deacons were involved in helping um, but this does not mean that you know um, they are not involved in spiritual ministry because we know that um, there were deacons like um, uh, Stephen who was involved in preaching and teaching in spiritual ministry. We also know that Philip was also a deacon which is basically waiting upon people, uh, widows and poor people, serving them food, rationing out food, getting rations in, getting food cooked. Uh, there were deacons but we see Philip at the time of persecution goes to Samaria and he does, does mighty uh, science, miracles, and wonders, which are accompanied by his teaching. And people in Samaria, where uh, all of them, you know, uh, became, uh, most of them became believers and accepted uh, the gospel. Okay. So that is the, the meaning of bishops and deacons in the context of the um, early church. So he says, that if a man desires this position of being a bishop and he desire but he desires a good work that means it's uh, it's a good desire to have you know to help uh, to be involved in the church to do some good work in the uh, church but you know he's saying don't quench that desire you know uh, but there should be some standard that we need to um, live up uh, to something that god expects of leaders not that anyone and every man because they have a desire they they you know uh, they can become spiritual leaders or bishops and deacons but he says telling uh, timothy there should be certain qualifications not just because they're male by gender but you know you should look up to some qualification there is some standard that they need to adhere to they have to live up to so he says a bishop then must be you know and he lists out specific qualifications for the leaders in the church um, and he says don't choose the leaders at random just because they want to volunteer uh, just because they aspire to be in a position you know uh, or not even because they are born leaders or natural leaders instead they should be chosen primarily on how they match these qualifications that are listed here and then he goes on to list those qualifications in verses 2 to five where he says they need to be blameless uh you know what's the meaning of blameless light live a life that is uh, right honoring pleasing before god and man you know live a, live a right life no one should find fault with your life uh you know husband of one wife we all know that i'm not going to explain uh temperate what does temperate mean anyone knows what meaning of temperate Anger, okay, what does temperate mean? Any idea? Temperate basically means to be self-controlled, the idea of someone who is not given to extremes, but they are reliable and trustworthy. Uh, sober-minded, what does sober-minded mean? What do you mean by being sober-minded? Any idea? Sober minded. To, to be kind, to be calm, to be calm person. One that is calm, that has feeling. That's my own opinion. Okay, thank you, success. Uh, so, sober minded basically means to be, uh, uh, yes, you know, you be calm. Uh, compassion, calm in your mind so that you're able to think clearly with clarity. Uh, somebody who's emotionally stable, uh, this describes a person who is able to think clearly with clarity. Okay. And good behavior means, you know, not being childish in your behavior, but being uh, good in your behavior. Then he goes on to say, be hospitable, able to uh, teach. Okay. So if you notice, here is the only time where he only once he mentions anything to do with their gift. What is a gift here? Hospitable, not able to teach. What is the gift here? Teach. Right. Yes. So, you know, it's only here, only once that he mentions anything to do with their gift. Able to teach. 
But the rest of the time, he's basically dealing with the character of the person, who the person is. Okay, so the kind of life you live is is very very important. Okay, it is God's standard and it's God's requirement to be a spiritual leader by the kind of life that you uh, live. But in in churches today, we look or the emphasis more is on spiritual gifting, right? How if you are if you go to work in a church, you're looking for a position in a church. So they look at your gifting, how gifted you are. You're a very good preacher, teacher. You know, you have the charisma. You have uh, the gifts in those areas. You know, yes, it is important. Uh, but uh, you know, God's word says that you know um, these words are, you know, are important. These things are important uh, for a spiritual leadership. But also, it's important your nature, who you are, your character is very, very important for uh, God. And we need to hold people accountable to this. And we need to hold people, uh, hold people, and we need to hold ourselves accountable uh, to our character. You know, I can't just put my gift on display, uh, you know, uh, 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 and not have a good character and not live a good lifestyle but you know I need to hold myself accountable to God uh, to the standards that he has set in his word in the way that I live my life the way I conduct my life in my lifestyle and my uh, behavior so I need to hold myself accountable to God's standards to uh, minister so when you are choosing people you know, if you're a place of authority, you're choosing people uh, uh, for your church or in your ministry team, just don't look at the gifts, but it's also important to look at their uh, character, their lifestyle. Okay. In verse 3, he says, not given to wine, uh, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not covetous. Okay. So, not somebody who drinks wine. Uh, we, you, uh, we also know what is the meaning of violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not um, covetous. Okay, so um, not violent means somebody who is not being violent, uh, not just uh, you know violent with uh, in the way they they treat their the wives, the children, or the people, uh, either you know uh, privately but also publicly. A man who will not let you know just quarrel for things or catch a fight with anyone and everyone, you know, a person who's not always fighting over something or the other, and also not a person who is covetous. What's the meaning of covetous? Sorry, desiring for others things. Okay. So this is a, a more encompassing uh, thought than merely being greedy for money or greedy for other things. A covetous man is never satisfied with anything, okay? Always demanding something more, something uh, different. So uh, a man who's constantly dissatisfied uh, is not fit for leadership among God's people, okay? Because a man who is covetous, who is not satisfied with the things that he has, his wealth, his riches, his position, the honor is receiving, you know, would always be greedy for more and, you know, that will cause his downfall. So, you know, when we look at choosing people for minist in ministry, we should not overlook these standards, but we need to uphold these standards in the house of God. So even as we as ministers of God, we need to continue to keep going to this. This should be a, like a checklist for us. Keep checking, you know, and correcting ourselves and changing the areas that we need to uh, change. Okay. Verse 4. Can one of you please read verse 4, please? One who rules his own house well having his children in submission with all reverence. Yes, so he's saying that, you know, choose a bishop or choose a people in spiritual uh, leadership, one, and it's important for them to have their own family in order. So if their own family is in order, then, you know, 
they are in a place of strength to minister to others. If their own family is falling apart, they are not in a good position to minister to others. Okay. Uh, verse 6, can somebody read verse 6 please? Not a novice, least being puffed up with pride, he falls, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Thank you, Lubega. So verse 6, he says, no, don't, uh, what does the meaning of a novice? A novice means? A new, a new, a new convert. Yes. Thank you. So don't put a new believer into a position of spiritual leadership. Why is he saying don't put somebody who's a new believer uh, or be quick in putting them in a place of spiritual leadership? Why is he telling him that? Any thoughts? I think because he has not yet put his theology into perspective, if I may use that word. Okay, he's still not grounded in his doctrines, his theology, yes. He can take off in the wrong doctrines, go misinterpret the word of God, yes. Any other thoughts? You know, it's important to observe a person's uh, life, their character, their lifestyle, the way they're living. You know, people take time to grow and mature. And, you know, um, so give them their time, observe them, give them small, small responsibilities, you know, see how well they do it, whether they're committed, they're passionate, or whether they're looking for position titles, or they, whether they're ir irrespective of that, they're willing to serve and work. And what is their kind of lifestyle they're living, their character, their nature, very important to observe. Also, you know, when they, uh, they're new believers and you give them uh, a position, a spiritual, especially a being a bishop, spiritual leadership, they can be filled with pride, okay? And, um, you know, um, like for example, Satan was filled with pride, okay? So, and, um, you know, he was cast out of the presence of uh, God. And we know that God resists the proud and... Uh, you know, the person will be totally disconnected from the presence of God because of his pride. So, you know, uh, to save this person from all of this harm and self-destruction, you know, just give them some time, uh, nurture them, help them to grow, mature, observe their lives, and then put them in a place of uh, spiritual responsibility or leadership. In the meantime, they can serve as a volunteer, you know, can then come to a place of being a deacon, then come to a place of being uh, a bishop if uh, they fit in that role. Verse 7, moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the uh, devil. Okay, if you read uh, verse 7 in the easy uh, to read version, it says an elder, an elder is another word, you know, uh, used for bishop, must also have the respect of people who are not part of the church, then he will not be criticized by others and be caught in the devil's trap. Okay, so what Paul is saying and writing Timothy is saying this important part of being a spiritual leader, you know, is um, uh, having right and good relationships, not only with people inside the church, but also outside the churches. Um, well. So the way a spiritual leader must live must be faultless before God and before the, uh, the saints in the church and before the world. Uh, if he's disgraced in the world, then the devil can use it as a trap to bring his downfall. You know, when a spiritual leader falls, we know the entire church you know, disintegrates, there can be strife, there can be division, uh, you know, pe people can be led astray, they can go away. And, um, you know, we see this in history as well, you know, when many great ministers have fallen uh, because the world has reported something wrong that they have uh, done. So it's not only important for us uh, just to live right in the sight of God, the church, but also before the 
world. But if you're living right before God, automatically we'll live right before the, the saints or the people in the church. If you're living right before uh, the saints in the church, we will automatically live right before the world. Okay. So any questions so far about the qualifications that he has uh, listed out for um, uh, spiritual leaders or so-called bishops in the early church? Now, we might think, hey, this does not uh, you know, minister to any of us. It does not, it's not of importance. But if you look at you know, this list, it's also important for us in our church today when we choose uh, spiritual leaders uh, people in leader uh, positions of authority and spiritual leadership, it's important to also have this as a checklist. Anyone wants to say anything, any questions, any doubts? Can you hear me, Pastor? Yes. It's just the, the last one where it says, moreover, he must have a good testimony. Uh, and, and it says in the end, like, uh, lest he fall into reproach uh, and the snare of the devil. Uh, so how it's connected to the snare of the devil? Just, just asking. Just have a little bit. Okay. okay. So here it says, then, you know, uh, we, uh, look, we looked at the easy uh, to read version. It says that, you know, the elder must also have respect of people who are not part of the church, then he will not be criticized by others and caught in the devil's trap. So the devil can use, you know, um, our uh, so called fleshly desires, natures, agendas that we have, you know, into his. And, and bring our downfall can cause um, our, us to be a wrong testimony uh, before the world okay and you know it can that can bring our downfall and also uh, the, uh, this can be used to bring a downfall of spiritual leaders in the in the church so we know that many uh, ministers of god you know um, uh, because the world has reported something wrong that they have done the world has, you know, either seen something that they have done, whether it's in the area of their relationships, their finances, and what they've done. They presented it to the world. It, you know, uh, it it's it's such a mockery to the to the uh, to the church, to the body of Christ, to God Himself, and you know, uh, this nature Satan can use to bring their downfall. Basically, he's talking about pride. All of these things can lead to pride, which was the what led to the downfall of Satan and to his condemnation eventually. Did that help? Okay. Anyone else has any questions? Doubts? Okay, if not, we will move on to verses 8 to 13, where he goes on to list the qualifications regarding deacons. Okay, so deacons are people who basically wait on others, serve. So uh, these could be uh, the connect team at church, the greeters, those who are serving tea, those who are helping out in various ushers and all of them, they are called as deacons. Okay, so he goes on to list the qualifications of deacons as well in verses 8 to uh, 13. Okay. And he says that, uh, you know, um, deacons must be reverent, okay? Uh, so they must be reverent about the things of God. Uh, they must be reverent about the house of God, which means reverence means the way they dress, the way they speak, the way they serve, should all have show reverence towards uh, God and the things of God, the house of God. God. Okay. And then he goes on to list uh, the qualifications required for deacons, which is kind of similar to what he lists out even for uh, bishops. So I'm not going to look at it in detail. But then in verse 9, he talks about faith with a pure conscience. Okay. So here we see once again, Paul repeats the importance of uh, holding on to faith with a good conscience. He mentions about this in chapter 1. And in chapter 2, and this is the third time he's 
talking about faith and good conscience. I hope you remembered we studied about faith and good conscience in chapter one and in chapter two as well. Okay, so your conscience must can be clear when you live right before God and uh, man. So even if your spiritual leaders are not watching over you, you know, uh, our conscience, we are, we need to hold our conscience accountable uh, to, because we're accountable to God. God is watching over us. Then verse 10, he says, but let the, these also first be tested and let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Okay. So he's saying, you know, first test them, examine them, prove, uh, let them prove that, you know, um, that their desire to serve is basically not just for any position, power to make themselves known or for pride, uh, you know, but uh, they have the right attitude to serve, the right desire to serve and begin by giving them small things. And if their attitude is somewhat you know, is right, they're committed, they're passionate, they're doing things well, they're very sincere, faithful, then you, uh, you know, put them in a place of leadership and um, responsibility, okay? Then verses 11 and 12, he continues to list out some important uh, uh, qualifications or requirements that are needed for deacons, which are the same as bishops, so I'm not going to uh, go through it again. Uh, we'll move on to verse 13. Uh, so can somebody read verse 13, please? Can somebody please read verse 13? For those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing and good boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. So when someone serves well as a deacon, there are two things they obtain. Okay, what are the two things they obtain? A good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so uh, they earn a good standing which they are in a place of stature and strength before God and man. Okay. And they can be bold, uh, you know, and they can be confident about their faith, about who they are as uh, believers or who they are in Christ Jesus. And they have that confidence, you know, or when they have this confidence, they're able to provide leadership and they're in the place of strength to serve. Okay. Um, uh, why are they able to... Uh, uh, serve, why are in the, they are in a place of strength to serve? Because they have a good track record, okay? So for those who've served well as deacons, he's saying, you know, God remembers your faithful service, even in tasks which may be considered as menial. Now, remember, deacons are just people who are ushering, people saying hi, hello, greeting, welcome, people who are serving tea, people who are, you know, doing set up and pack up and all of those things. You know, they their job can be considered as menial compared to people who go up on the stage and spiritual leadership, preaching and teaching. But you know, Paul is saying, hey, you know, God remem will remember your faithful ser uh, service. God remembers your faithful uh, service. Even if you look at your task as very menial, you know, you need to be faithful, sincere, committed, uh, you know, um, adhere to these qualifications, you know, live a lifestyle that's honoring and pleasing faith with a good conscience and when we do that you know you will be in a place of strength to serve and also that God will remember your faithful uh, service okay and he says a faith which is in Christ Jesus which means all the work of people who serve in the church you know is basically pointed towards building God's people okay so we know that prophecy is for edification Okay, all the the gifts, the membership gifts, or the, the spiritual gifts, um, all of that is for the edification of the church, the building of God's people in the faith which is in Christ uh, Jesus. So, you know, whatever area you're serving, you know, serve in uh, in such a way 
that you know that um you know like as a deacon like philip and stephen you know full of they were full of wisdom and full of the uh, spirit okay so even if you're laying chairs you know as you're laying chairs in the in the hall you can pray over each chair you know you can decree over each chair you can speak god's promises over each chair say god whoever sits on this chair they come with um, you know feeling weak uh, your word says you know uh, you know you give strength to those who are uh, you increase their might you in give them a uh, strength god those who are financially going through struggles or going through debts in jesus name i declare and decree that you know they are blessed their cup is pressed down shaken overflowing and you know they are blessing to people so even as you are laying those chairs you can release a supernatural even if you are somebody who's just greeting you know you're just shaking your hands with somebody you know you're just stepping into church and you're greeting them you know you can release a supernatural in their life you can say god you know uh, uh i'm uh give me when i meet people today i'm in the greeters team it's my uh i'm rostered today uh even as i meet people help me to release a supernatural so you're just meeting them but you are you know god is the holy spirit is telling you something you say hey you know this is what god is telling me he's giving you this promise or he's saying this and they'll they'll be amazed and shocked you know so the, as a church before we wait for pastor to finish the sermon and pray and release words of healing and and all of that you when people enter in can just you know release a supernatural or when you're giving tea you know you can just say god i i bless this tea who drinks it you know they'll be in good health whatever infirmities you know by the stripes of jesus they are healed so you can pray over that can you can release a supernatural when people come and you know um, the holy spirit is saying hey say this to this person say this to this person you can keep on you know releasing the supernatural prophecies word of wisdom word of knowledge imagine what a powerful church you know your church will be i think as a as pastors if some of you are pastors spiritual leaders your handlings teams in your church you can just get your team to release the supernatural in these ways you know there's a church that um, uh, 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 you know um, uh, the pastor's sermons I, they, I listen to a church that flows in the supernatural they believe uh, you know um, uh, you know to bring God's kingdom uh, he heaven here on earth to do his will here on earth and this is a church that releases a supernatural through everything so even if um, you know they have people stepping in for their uh, seminars their uh, conferences and their people at the registration table even in the registration table they're just releasing the supernatural so people who come and register and give their names they're just releasing the supernatural so they're doing fun activities you know playing games or anything they're releasing the supernatural amazing church you know i mean just through everything whether they you know uh, through uh, people who are doing uh, choreography during the worship they're releasing the supernatural those who are painting uh, uh, on stage during worship time they're not just painting there but you know uh, they uh, they uh, uh, they paint based on what the holy spirit is saying and who the holy spirit wants to give this painting to what is the the word of wisdom knowledge of prophecy they want to release what they want to speak and decree over their lives they just do that just imagine what a powerful church it is just from the from the time you enter till the amen everything is supernatural you know i think uh, that is the kind of church that god wants us to have that is a church of the kind of church that we can envision as pastors drive it towards that lead our people uh, uh, towards that so everybody can rise up to be uh, ministers you know or because all of us are uh, royal priesthood and ministers in the house of god okay any thoughts on that anything anyone wants to share anything okay so he's basically saying you know uh, do everything that will build god's people edify them in the faith which is in christ uh, jesus then he goes on to talk about proper conduct in god's house verses 14 
uh, to 15, and verses 14 and 15. Can somebody read verses 14 and 15, please? These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am de uh, delayed, I write also. I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Amen. Thank you. You know, I just wanted to share um, from my own life. You know, just uh, uh, going back to the previous point. You know. Uh, at church, I basically uh, on Sundays meet the f people who come, you know, the first time visitors. And when the first time visitors come, many of them are non Christians, many are just invited, you know, they're just coming there. But uh, I, I just pray and say, God, um, I want to release the supernatural, I want to speak into their lives, uh, you know, whether it is speaking divine destiny, divine favor, divine order, you know, you know, speaking to their lives in their situations, difficulties. So, God, just help me just really so you know, just imagine how powerful it is when people come to the church and you know and here you're saying hey hi hello and you know where you come from blah blah you ask them everything and then you just say can i pray for you and it's not just general prayer but you just you know speaking into their lives you're just decreeing you're declaring god's word and they are going to you know, want to come back to your church. They want to uh, come back because they're ministered to, because they felt the presence of God, because they heard God speak to them. Or even if they don't come back, you know, they're going back with um, a divine destiny, a divine order, divine, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, encouragement that they receive from God, a promise that they can hold on to. Um, people who have given up on life, people who are suicidal, people who have not seen any breakthroughs. Just imagine how the power of God can be released in and through their um, lives. Okay. So coming back to verses 14 and 15, he says, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, you know, and he says um, in verse 15, how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. So Paul's purpose for writing and sharing this with Timothy or giving instructions to Timothy as a leader is for him, his practical information on how to run things at the churches at um, Ephesus. And look at how he talks about uh, the church. He talks about the church as the house of God. Okay. Um, and then he says, uh, the house of God, which is a church of the living God. And look at how he describes it. The pillar and ground of truth. Okay. Uh, so the church must be very consciously the place where God is, okay? And this is what, you know, attracts people more than anything else. So church is God's house because he is the architect, because he is the builder. He lives there. He provides. He is honored there. And he rules there, okay? Because the church is the house of God. It's the family of God. So any house, you know, people are provided, cared for, people live there, you know, uh, people are respected. Uh, there's respect between husband and wife, then that's when relationships go smoothly together. And it's the governmental structure the, in the house where the man rules. So that is the house of God. In the house of God, it's not the pastor who's the architect, builder, one who provides to be honored, who rules, but it's God who's the architect. He's the builder. He's the one who rules, reigns. He's the one who's to be honored. He lives there and he provides because it is his house and we are the family of God. Okay. We'll stop here and we'll come back after the break. I'm so sorry for the, 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 the wrong link. Apologize. Uh, okay. We'll see you after the break.